Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. I'm here with Charlie. Charlie is the CEO of Pando, which I think is a fantastic concept and also one I've never heard before. So Charlie, can you tell us what Pando is? Absolutely. It's funny how often I hear that. A great idea. And how do you turn a concept into a compelling business, right? That's the name in the game. The name Pando is the name for a group of aspen trees. It's actually the largest of a group of aspen trees that grow together. And what makes that group unique is that when aspen trees grow next to each other, their roots extend down and then intertwine. And they go from being many individual organisms to being one very large interconnected organism. Again, the largest of which is called Pando. It's located in Utah and it's the oldest, heaviest, largest organism on earth. And it's resilient because there is strength and sharing across that ecosystem. So It's going to make more sense in in a second. We started a a company with a flagship product called Income Pooling. And the, the basic idea behind Income Pooling is we help groups of individuals who choose and pursue these dreamer, highly volatile, high variance, high upside, but also high risk of failure careers, such as professional athletes, entrepreneurs. And we help them find a group of other similarly situated individuals where they can come together, choose to join a pool with a particular group and sign a legal contract where they agree to contribute a small portion of their future income, always above some threshold, to the shared group. In doing so, they're getting a diversified income portfolio, in essence, of other amazing entrepreneurs or athletes. And there's the embedded aligned incentives that come from joining a group where you're motivated to see the members of your pool succeed because their success becomes yours. It's been a fun business to run. We work with amazing and fun clients, and there's a lot still to build. I thought this was awesome for a few reasons. One, I never knew what Pando was. So when I went to your website, I was like, why is Charlie talking about trees? I don't understand how this ties into the business network. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, that's really cool. You combine community with this. You align incentives with the entrepreneurs inside this small group, and then they help them enable and empower each other where normally you go at this alone. You're building the support network around yourself, which is pretty cool socially, but also from a professional standpoint. We like to think a lot about the power of incentives. Stemming back to starting this business, the distinct problem that my co-founder and I set out to solve was one of income risk and career risk. I met him while I was at Stanford Business School. My co-founder, Eric, was also a computational mathematical engineer. He's the type of guy that for fun, does independent studies with labor economists. And thankfully for me, that that is his version of fun. He paid for all of those graduate degrees with sports and politics betting algorithms that he wrote. And then, you know, it's independent studies and board games. I've partnered with an oblique and brilliant mind, and he took that research. And the research suggested, interestingly, that we are graduating many more individuals into an increasingly winner-take-all economy. So Many more careers are going to look and feel from a risk perspective like being an entrepreneur as opposed to, for example, being a doctor. There's going to be more upside and more winner-take-all kind of outcomes or winner-take-most. It's interesting because you look around and you think about these major asset classes that each one of us owns, whether it's like our health, our portfolio, our home. You have the ability to insure that asset or hedge it. And with your own potential income, which I would argue is the largest asset class on earth, there's nothing. A lot of people sell their businesses too early because they're worried about being too concentrated. They're like, all my wealth is wrapped up in this. And if they had some way to diversify that, they might run the business longer. I think this is one of the funny things that I sometimes hear when you hear, let's say, venture capitalists or other investors being nervous about a founder taking a secondary early in their journey. And and that's never made sense to me because the deeper you go into the experience, in essence, the more kind of elevated the opportunity cost is. And if you want folks continuing to try to hit the home run and continue to push for that biggest outcome, you have to help them satisfy some basic needs too. When we think about Maslow, he designed that pyramid (laughs) for a reason, right? And so you're right. What we see is if you can take portfolio theory to your own economic future, you're more likely to continue to swing big rather than settling for the single and maybe the small exit. With Pando, you have a higher likelihood of having many individuals who contribute to a pool and you continue to try to elevate their game as they try to elevate yours, as you try to capture that big dream that led you to the diving board of entrepreneurship. Charlie, can you tell me about Pando as a structured business? How many people are in Pando? How does Pando make money? 
And then how does Panda find more people to engage? When we started Panda, we started in professional baseball. And we've signed and work with over you know, 450 professional baseball players. So those minor league and major league professional baseball players. It's my understanding that I think we're the largest institution in baseball. I think we have more clients than any agency or financial advisory firm. And those are spread across 80 wow. plus different pools. Four years in, my co-founder and I looked at each other and we noted, hey, we're only bringing this to others. We should bring this closer to home. And as founders, this is a product that we want. And we created a line of the business focused on founders and entrepreneurs. We have roughly a similar client size on that side of the house. And one of the things that's been super interesting is to watch how our founders have really started to cooperate, right? So once they're in a pool, all of a sudden they're trying to organize organically into monthly pool meetings to swap war stories, compare notes, avoid pitfalls, make warm investor introductions, customer introductions, et cetera. I think when you reflect on baseball players as compared with entrepreneurs, those are very different individuals writ large. And we see that as a testament to all the places that income pooling can go in the future. For now, we run a marketplace. And so we've got a kind of direct to consumer model where we've got an outbound SDRA sales function. We also on the entrepreneur side work with venture firms to work with and support their portfolio. And Pando makes money on the income pooling side of the house when there are dollars that flow through a pool. So we take a small portion of the dollars that eventually flow through a pool. And then we also charge monthly fees for those who were providing kind of real time and monthly community support. Panda has been around for seven years now. How many individuals have quote unquote made it? How many have had a good exit or were able to contribute to the pool? Yeah, this is one of those things when you start a business, you think everything's going to happen quicker than it does, right? I built a business that would have benefited from a time machine as well. When the baseball side of things is we've continued to see our clients outperform their algorithmic expectations. They're getting cut and released at lower rates than you would expect. They're getting promoted at higher rates than you'd expect. Their careers are lasting longer than you would expect. We now have baseball players in basically every locker room, but that might not be precisely accurate. Minimally, the vast majority of baseball locker rooms and almost every single MLB locker room, we have guys who are in Pando pools and we have more contributors every single year. On the entrepreneur side, this is now our third year. It's kind of extraordinary. The top quartile of our customers that we work with, their companies are up 12x in enterprise value since they started working with Pando. What stage are they in whenever they normally sign with Pando? We really see a density in the post C to Series B range. It's typically founders that have raised maybe 5 to 20 million in equity and own probably a similar amount in their company. That's a sweet spot for us in terms of where we start working with clients. And then going back to your question on exit, we've actually had many more contributions on the entrepreneurship side, which has actually been, frankly, surprising. That's been mostly in the form of secondaries over the past couple of years when externally what you keep hearing is the secondary market's dead and the M&A market's dead. And we haven't seen that with our clients, which has been exciting. I'm very interested in the data that you're collecting from the baseball side and from the entrepreneurship side. I think that's very interesting. And it's a little bit of, are you guys beating the norm because of the community aspects? Or is it because of there being a little bit of an alignment between these are people that are more forward looking and early adopters, and these might be higher performers on average, and or maybe a combination of both of those things that lean towards a better outcome. Do you have any thoughts? At this stage, these are hypotheses, right? What I think we're seeing is a combination of different effects. So first off, when we're recruiting, or for example, when pool members introduce us to someone that they're interested in being their pool, we tend to be sourcing from a high caliber of a founder. Folks that have raised from great institutions maybe are coming out of great institutions or schools or accelerators. And so there's a sourcing side of things at the top of our funnel. And then we qualify them. And then there's this process of going through a marketplace and being considered for a pool. And the way a pool works is you both have to want to join and a majority of people in that pool have to also want you to join. But there's further curation 
at the entrepreneur level that creates a kind of like secondary Swiss cheese layer on who gets to participate. That's been really interesting. I definitely think there's some high quality elements to the way in which we are sourcing and vetting. I think that founders often are, you hear this, I'm so heads down. I, I'm so laser focused on what I'm doing. I can't pay attention to anything else. I don't actually think that's a good way to build a successful, enduring business. I think you need to be heads up. You need to be looking around the corner. You need to be out in the wild. You need to be talking to customers and you better be opening as many doors as you can and creating as many areas of opportunity and serendipity as possible. A pool supercharges that, right? It creates alignment with a group of other individuals who are now motivated to see you win. When they're in that pool meeting and they're comparing notes and asking each other for favors, it doesn't require charity. It doesn't require folks helping out of the goodness of their heart and their experience as an entrepreneur. We're leaning into a self-interested alignment of incentives. Like your help, first of all, encourages a reciprocal relationship where you're more likely to then get help. And secondly, your help directly benefits someone who may be a contributor to the pool. I think it creates some interesting opportunities for Pando to layer other products, including funding and financing pathways for the clients that we work with. Hey, podcast listeners, if you guys are interested in cold email outbound outreach that actually works or thought leadership and how to build a community around some of the things that you're working on, I highly recommend incendiumstrategies.com. They're not just sponsoring this podcast, but they're also helping us with a lot of the communities that we run on the back end. So if that's something that resonates with you guys and you're interested in learning more, check out incendiumstrategies.com. Thank you guys. Hey, podcast listeners. This is Nate from the Made It Podcast. Wanted to reach out to any uh, founders, growth marketers, sales leaders listening. We've made a community just for you and we wanted to invite you to join. We have growth playbooks for you to use instructional events a few dozen every month to learn how to use the latest technology, uh, even some free services that can be helpful to help your company grow. The first thousand people to join are free. We've created a link. You can click on it in the bio for this episode. We hope to join us over our community. You're talking about things that you can add on to it. And I want to know what does this hypothesis look like at scale? If Panda works out and you're in every locker room in uh, the baseball arena, but also in, in football, and then you start going into different industries, right? What does Pando look like if it was to almost be like an industry force or a macroeconomic factor? When I started the company, I, I thought about it as we all deserve to be able to take control of our own potential income. And there needs to be products and services out there to help people do that. Whether you think about them as versions of insurance or hedges or ways to collateralize that asset or ways to invest that asset, leverage that asset. I thought about income pooling as being a thoughtfully designed and elegant community first version of bringing the potential income asset to life. And I thought that we could continue to bring income pooling vertical by vertical or customer segment by customer segment everywhere and around the world. And we would eventually be able to drive our cost structure down to offering monthly pools for uh, Uber drivers as an example. Now, standing here today, seven years in, in some ways, I think my ambitions and visions for Pando have broadened really what I hope to be able to build as a reimagined financial institution. What I mean by that is if you could, you know, strip down to brass tacks, like what it takes to decide which bank you're going to work with, typically you're solving on one lever, and that's the lever of like product quality, customer experience, and cost. And those are table stakes, right? That's what, you know, most financial institutions compete on. Something I think SVB did really well, and maybe we don't need to unpack all the things that went less well. Something that SVB did well was they created a institution with real network effects where you were interested in working with SVB precisely because of the other people that were clients. And you were more likely to be successful in your job because you banked with SVB. There was a positive network effect element of working with that institution. I think that's clearly a value add if, if you can bring that to life. And that certainly is something we're trying to do. Banks are designed to help folks who have money hold on to that money and earn more of it. And if we could go back to first principles, I would love to build an institution that helps you make money in the first place, helps you be more successful in the career that you have chosen. 
which ultimately allows for Panda to offer other products and services over time and creates more quote unquote bank assets. I also want to be very clear. We are not a bank. <laughs> we're not doing anything that is banking centric today. But as I imagine where we are going, I like thinking about this kind of community first approach towards a institution that layers products and services and helps folks win both professionally and financially. It's almost like downside insurance. It's like healthcare insurance when something goes wrong, right? Tornado insurance for when a tornado hits your house. You're talking about like upside insurance in a way where you're pooling resources and you're paying out in that way. Is there any other examples of this upside network pooling that you've heard of? Have you seen other examples of this? It's kind of interesting. When we started the company, there were so many folks who were like, I've never heard of anything like this and, and I can't imagine anything similar. And I think I may be able to reframe it a little bit for you where you're going to be like, oh yeah. If you think about a private equity firm or a law firm and the partnership agreement, they have an obligation to contribute certain things, their work and sometimes some of their capital. And what do they get in return? They get a portion of carry, which includes a portion of the output and the success of the other partners of that firm. They've decided that they are better together than they would be separately, right? And and that, in essence, is what Pando is. It's a group of folks who have come together and said, I actually think I'm more likely to win. I'm more likely to be successful with this group at my side than I would be as a standalone entrepreneur. And we see this in baseball too, right? You think about the agents, for example, they have a portfolio of clients and they are thoughtful about who's in that portfolio. And of course, they're rooting for every single one of their athletes to be as successful as possible. They just also know that they all won't. And so they're, they're taking a thoughtful approach to, hey, do I have enough here where I have a risk adjusted likelihood of earning 5% from a few of these winners? And that ends up being their business model too. There's some interesting support infrastructure around people that are in professional sports or entrepreneurship or acting like the idea of having an agent negotiate on your behalf is something that's relatively novel for this subset of groups but it's also something that a lot of people would benefit from the ability to have someone negotiate on your behalf understand what industry norms are make connections where it makes sense there's the banking aspect of this and you're building a community around this, but there's also these other add-on services that do you see any of that as far as like collective negotiating, working with possibly vendors on a larger volume? You know, first off, like what that rings a bell for me is I was just listening to another one of your great podcasts with Jason Kirby and he designed a boutique investment bank as a founder designed to work with founders specifically to serve that role, right? I mean, we call it something different for the founder ecosystem. It's not an agent, it's an investment bank, right? And I think that you're really tapping into something here, right? Which is what many companies are realizing is so much of the value is trapped in the power of the community. It's the power of the personalities that you work with and serve. And so for Pando, one of the things that we've kind of done is we have a preferred partner network where we work with head hunting firms and we work with all these other kind of founder support service providers and product providers. And we can go to them and say, hey, look, here's the kind of ecosystem that we support. Here's how valuable that ecosystem can be to you. And if they pass muster and we think that there's someone that that are you know worth being advertised on, on the Pando platform, we can structure a deal where the Pando pool members get a benefited rate because they're a member of a large and valuable community. We have in Echo, the Entrepreneur Cooperative and Post-Exit Founder Groups, there's these Google spreadsheets that we keep track of. And I think Y Combinator also has a similar thing where they're like, here's the vendors that we recommend. Here's the different VCs and how our founders have reported back on what it's like to work with them. If the amount of time that you spend, if you work with the wrong vendor and the amount of cost that that can add up to is is pretty drastic. Like for a marketing vendor, that could be three to six months of retainer, which is probably like 40 to 100,000, depending on which work you're, you're doing with that vendor. Just having someone say, yes, this person does good work. This is an example of the work that they did for me is, is a pretty big deal. Most founders, whether you're a first time founder or a serial founder, you, you bring a, a DIY hustle attitude to the game. And there's this kind of reticence to bring in outside support oftentimes that I think is misplaced. And, and part of that is just based on a lack of experience or a lack of kind of trust and understanding that the maybe 
the one person's advice that you received is strong enough to advice to warrant a really big capital investment decision. So this is, again, one of these things where I think about crowdsourcing a knowledge base, right? So we've got, you know, hundreds of founders that have built these great, growing, exciting companies, some of which, by the way, have been sold, some of which have gone away, they've re-stepped into the plate. But if we can mine that knowledge base and be a better kind of curation mechanism to help new founders or founders who embrace that like next chapter of their journey run into a new set of three problems and we can point them towards a crowdsourced solution, that's definitely kind of a beneficial byproduct of a big, strong community. There's definitely a little bit of fear and there's some like risk reward as far as not just money that you're investing in this vendor or this new software, but time. I was on a, a sales call today and they're like, we're looking for a year contract. I'm like, that's a very long time. And they're like, but you believe in this space. And I'm like, but I don't know if I believe in you. They're like, we're the only ones that do this. And I'm like, I test 10 to 15 softwares a week. You are probably number five in the last 12 hours. And they're saying that they probably need 10 or 15 hours a week to make sure that this is executed on correctly. And I'm like, even if I hire someone to do that, that's still a lot of time to hire that person. I'm doing a, a risk on multiple different levels as far as the person executing and this new vendor. So I think that like recommendation or that internal database is just that little 5% push to say, yeah, I'll give this a shot. I believe in this channel or this this vendor. A little push helps. And when you're making high conviction bets, it's helpful if you have conviction, <laughs> right? So it's kind of one of those things where it's like, hey, look, if you can help crowdsource ammo from folks that are in the arena with you and you can get free lessons on the bad stories and the good success cases, that's valuable. As an example, our founders have raised from over 750 you know, distinct venture firms or institutional investors. And so we've built a give to get warm introduction, a you know, warm investor introduction platform. And it allows for a really elegant way for founders to ask other founders what they think about their investors and whether or not they're willing to make an introduction. And that warm investor intro is, is probably the best way to get an investor's attention too. So it happens to be a really high fidelity connection when it works. It also has the added benefit of you instantly unearth a data point or multiple data points on a firm, an investor, and you get to learn from those conversations in a way where you go in with a strong point of view on whether or not this is someone you want to work with or not. Charlie, this is your, your first company that you have started. Is that correct? Other than a high school foray into doing home energy audits, we did it for two summers. And I think then my junior year, while I was in junior year, Target all of a sudden realized that this was definitely a business that was going to be <laughs> relevant and lowered the cost of a light bulb to like, you know, 12 cents. And all of a sudden I was out of business. So uh, <laughs> other other than that, than, oh, yeah. than that and being maybe ahead of the curve and not knowing how to properly scale a company in high school, this is my first, uh, I would say, real shot on goal. One of the points I wanted to bring up, and you just highlighted it like perfectly well, is in a high school, I didn't know what an audit was. I didn't know what my parents' energy bill was, let alone like going door to door to ask people about what type of light bulbs you're using, right? And the same is true for Pando as far as like if I'm in a room full of entrepreneurs that are starting a business for the first time and they're taking their first shot on goal, they're usually talking about uh, starting an event-based app or a commonly known company before X, right? And so I don't often hear, we're going to do finance structures and income pooling for entrepreneurs at scale and we're going to start with baseball players. Like it's such a unique business vertical to start out. At. It's very interesting. I don't know how you heard the word art, like audit before the age of like 23, but I think it's pretty cool that you, you piece those two companies together. Yeah. I think I learned that one on the fly, like probably a first, you know, <laughs> knocking on the door sales pitch. And I didn't actually know how to articulate what I was selling. And probably the homeowner was like, oh, you, you want to do an audit? And I was like, great. Yeah. I love audits. We had some success. It was a good idea. We just didn't know how to you know move quickly and scale or defend anything. I think being an entrepreneur requires a significant amount of self-confidence and a leap of faith in yourself and your ability not only to hopefully see a real problem and then go chase it down, but also to be able to learn and adapt on the fly. One of the things that's really interesting is that you could map who becomes an entrepreneur based on risk tolerance. 
right? You, you, you tend to need a healthy quotient of risk tolerance. And I'm not sure that's a good way to sort talent and sort entrepreneurs, right? I, I don't think risk tolerance is predictive of success. And it was one of the things that I thought a lot about as we started Pando, which is how many people are we leaving at the starting line who aren't ready to take the leap, maybe because they don't have the fallback opportunity. They don't have a safety net. They didn't graduate from X school, whatever. And that was one of the other things that is kind of aspirational about what we're building at Pando, which is helping give many more the comfort level and the keys to be able to leap and leap knowing that they can do so with a kind of diversified economic opportunity still ahead of them and with a community supporting them that's ready to roll, especially if they didn't come from a, maybe a place or through a pathway where they have that embedded network already. Being an entrepreneur is hard and it can feel really lonely, but it doesn't have to be. In some ways, I think you're giving them a shortcut to whenever they sell their company for the first time, the second time they have a network, they understand some lessons learned, but by pulling them together, they're able to learn five times as fast or seven times as fast from the seven other people that are inside their cohort or their group. If you can have that kind of stable touch base, where not just are you meeting with a bunch of different people, but even the same people back to back. So you don't have to like rehash. This is why I did last time. This is the hypothesis. You're just progressing together. And I like that piece of it. Prior to starting Pando, we actually looked at starting a different company. It was a physical therapy adherence business. And basically the idea is physical therapy actually really works. There's a reason that your insurance company like always demands that you do PT before getting surgery. The problem is that only 1% of the PT happens when you're in the office with your physical therapist. The other 99% is supposed to happen at home. And we tend to be lazy. We tend to forget. We tend to not do. We were thinking about a model where, hey, what if we created some smart tech? We allowed for that work at home to be measured. It could be reflected back to the physical therapist. You have the accountability lined up. The insurance company, if they knew you were actually doing the at-home PT, actually would pay for you to do it. Not, and not, not a significant amount of money, but enough to just bend the arc of incentives such that you start doing the thing that is in your own interest. It was an interesting business. I think it should still exist. But it, the reason I bring it up is I think that this is an example where doing things that bend the incentives towards you embracing the right behaviors can make all the difference in the world. And for many of our clients, I think they think about the economics of income pooling as being a nice to have. And hey, am I willing to give up my hundredth millionth to help ensure that I win that first millionth? Yeah, I think for many that that ends up being a relatively common sense trade. But I think many of them actually just say, you know what, that is a product feature. The product is actually what happens because I now have aligned incentives with this group. It is going to force me to do the 99% work. I'm going to pick up the phone, not in my pool meeting, and I'm going to call the person that I have a depth of relationship with now when I have the problem on a Tuesday morning at 730 and they're going to answer the phone and actually give me a little bit of their precious time, specifically because they're motivated to do so. We both have that relationship and there's, you know, again, alignment of economic outcome. That's fantastic. Are there any Pando companies that you're particularly excited about right now? And it could be for the concept or maybe the traction that they have. There's many. One of the gifts of this business is I can't imagine working with a more exciting and fun client segment, right? I get to go to baseball games and watch as a fan, but also kind of like the ultimate fantasy sports owner. Either way this goes, I'm good. It's the same with the entrepreneurs. I think that one of the things that's been really interesting to watch is with the AI revolution, how many pool meetings are evolving into conversations about how to adopt and pivot towards embracing this changing technology set. And so I think one of the things that's been really interesting is to see a few of our companies who are doing well and growing take the bold bet to not keep doing the thing that was working well, right? So maybe they're growing 50%, 100% year on year. And you know what? They lay it all down and they embrace a new product and a new investment strategy that kind of results in a J-curve-like outcome of a retreat from the operating results that they were seeing with the promise of something much larger. And seeing some of those come out the other chart side and have that bold bet pay off 
has been super exciting too. Charlie, I can see Pando being a company that you run for a very long time. Do you see that being the case? I, I would love to. I have a background in private equity investing, and I realized in doing that that I wanted to build. I wanted to be closer to a team and lead a team. I wanted to be closer to product and closer to customers. And I have loved every moment of running Pando. Well, maybe not every moment, but I've loved every day. And I can't imagine a platform that gives me an opportunity to affect such positive change where we have such seemingly limitless opportunity ahead of us to layer products and services that allow me to flex different muscles, especially on the kind of investing side. So I could definitely see this being something that I am closely attached to for decades in the future. And I try to take that long term orientation when I think about building the business too and raising money for the business and choosing partners and hiring and building a culture. I'm not trying to win a nine month sprint. I want to win a 50 year game. Charlie, that's a pod. Where should people go to find you? You can find me on LinkedIn and please check us out at pandopooling.com. And no, we do not sell swimming pools, though that has been a, a, a common issue <laughs> in the past. Charlie, I appreciate it. And we'll be in touch soon. All right. Thanks, Connor. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.